Okay, can I um, call the meeting to order and can I welcome everyone to this, the third meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019. A first agenda item is to agree whether to take item four relating to our work programme in private. Are we agreed? Okay, thank you. Agenda item two is consideration of new petitions. The first new petition is petition 1714, lodged by James McLaughlin, Jean Watson and Ivy Dodds on interstitial lung disease and home management. The petition calls for the Scottish Government to provide funding to help raise awareness of the condition and the development of a cohesive national plan for home management. I may have to take apologies from Jackson Carlow MSP who has expressed an interest in this petition and will um, continue um, to um, attend to our conversations and discussions on the petition itself. We will take evidence from two of the petitioners this morning, James McLaughlin and Jean Watson. Can I welcome you both to the meeting? And I would invite you to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes between you, after which we'll move to questions from the committee to assist our understanding of the condition and to be clear about the action you're calling for in your petition. Okay. Okay. Thank you, thank you all for, for giving us the opportunity of expanding on the issues which were raised in the petition to raise awareness of interstitial lung disease and in home management. Jean and Ivy and I are all sufferers, as you can see, of ILD and members of the West of Scotland ILD support group. Unfortunately, Ivy, due to health difficulties, was unable to travel to the meeting today. The thrust of the petition is for the government to provide funding for the issues raised in the petition. Uh, I'll not go back over all the issues in the petition because you seem to be aware of them. One of the main problems we're finding is in awareness. There seems to be a complete lack of awareness of interstitial lung disease. And statistics in the petition highlighted, particularly in people seeking their first appointment with GPs. This delay of up to maybe two, three years for people going to the GP for the first appointment is completely unacceptable. And we feel this must be addressed by the government and by all and by increasing public awareness. I myself are a sufferer, as you can see, with ILD. And with hindsight, I myself should have visited my own GP some two years before I did go. This basically was down to PI, like most people, was completely unaware of ILD and of its effects. And I put down my increasing breathlessness due basically to age and to asthma, which I had been diagnosed with some eight years prior to my ILD diagnosis. I still receive asthma medication, so there was no possibility of any bad um, diagnosis there. <coughs> One of the other major problems is actually in the delay in diagnosis of ILD. ILD, by its nature, mimics many other diseases and ailments. It has no known cause, except in a few industrial cases like minors and people like that, unfortunately. And there's no known cause or trigger to start it. We suggest that this may be remedied for the particulars as we set out in the petition. Uh, when people go to their doctors, they automatically get a chest examination immaterial, whether they've got a sore toe or not, if they're over the age of 60 or round about that, give them a chest examination. It only takes two minutes. Lift up your shirt, throw up your mouth. Let's do that. That will help to diagnose ILD and many other um, respiratory diseases. Other illnesses and diseases, for example, lung and other cancers, presently have or are still getting very well funded awareness programmes. Surely ILD and other similar respiratory diseases is well within the scope for government funding and for implementation of whatever we can come up with there. This would increase public awareness and highlight that a quality of life is expected after diagnosis. It would also bring ILD out of the shadows and open it to public awareness and public acceptance for what it is. We sometimes find ourselves there is not an avoidance by the public, but there is difficulty in getting the public to accept we have got an illness, a, a, a deadly illness. Sitting, if I take this off, I, look, I hopefully look the picture of health 
but I'm not. <laughs> um, and this is what we've got to overcome. It should never be overlooked that ILD idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis are insidious, incurable diseases with debilitating breathlessness, as you can see. The petition highlighted the benefits of going to the home management side. The benefits highlighted of home management and how it should be provided were highlighted in the petition. This again is within the scope of the government and local authorities. The provision of pulmonary rehabilitation is a mainstay in maintaining a quality of life open to sufferers. It gets us out and about, it keeps us mobile and it keeps us moving. Other home management necessities have been highlighted in the petition and they cover so many things that I'm not having the time to go through them all. We would need to write a book and take a few days if we started to list, list and discuss all the effects of living with ILD, from pre-diagnosis to post-diagnosis to actually living with ILD. We understand that a National Respiratory Plan for Scotland has been proposed, and we feel that any delay in its formation and implementation can only cause untold suffering throughout Scotland. We therefore urge the committee to consider the petition and thereafter to urge the government to act, responsibly, act responsibly. I'm going to not say any more. Right. Jean, she has a lot of words to say. Okay. Uh, my circumstances have been very similar to Jim's. I was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis two and a half years ago. I'd always been told that my health problems were caused by allergies and stomach problems. And like a lot of people use standard medication for these. I retired from work four years ago, mainly due to a recurring cough and feeling increasingly tired throughout the working day. An exacerbation in my condition led, to me, led me to being referred to hospital and I was eventually diagnosed with IPF. This was an illness I had never heard of and none of my family had either. <clears throat> On joining the West of Scotland ILD support group, I met other patients who had the same condition. Talking with fellow patients has shown me that they have had very similar problems in late diagnosis, mainly due to lack of awareness and understanding of their conditions. The symptoms they display may be treated with the underlying serious condition not identified. Most patients have other serious health problems in addition to ILD, which are classed as comorbidities and make treatment more complex. Interstitial lung disease affects middle-aged and older people. We feel many people put up with their health problems due to lack of knowledge and the idea that they are just getting a bit older. This condition causes a debilitating loss of physical activity, leading to people being unable to care for themselves. The impact on their daily life is considerable. From simple activities of looking after their house to experiencing emotional problems and feelings of social isolation. As this is an incurable condition, we feel there is considerable need to raise awareness of ILD to assist earlier diagnosis and create a consistent approach to care throughout Scotland. And uh, we're happy to ask, uh, answer any of your questions. OK, thank you very much for that. And I appreciate that when it's something that's directly affecting you, it's, it's even more of a challenge, perhaps, to, to bring the petition forward. And I think the, the case you made is, is, is really interesting. Certainly, I hadn't heard of the, the condition before. And, um, and the challenges that go with it. I suppose if I uh, were to open up the questioning, you already talked about this condition mimics others or people think it's something else. And one of the things you suggested was that um, GPs would carry out chest examinations as a, a matter of routine. Does this happen anywhere? Are you aware of any countries where this does happen? And even if they were taking the chest examination, do GPs know what they should be listening for? And is that a problem? I, I, th I think it is a problem, um, and that's why I went in the petition. I think we've asked for extra training for GPs and how to fund extra training for GPs so they can to help them diagnose um, ILD. It's a difficult disease to diagnose because it, mimic, it mimics so many other chest infections, various other things. I mean, ILD itself is covers about two or three hundred various degrees of illnesses and it is very very difficult for GPs to isolate and, and do it. Really they need a full x-ray and thereafter in hospital care to, to diagnose it. We need the GPs to be more aware of it 
I personally was very fortunate when I did go to the doctor. My doctor seemed to, he must have had patients with it before because he recognised it right away. But we know other patients and an awful lot of people in our group have terrible difficulties with their GPs in getting diagnosed. It's a chest infection, take this, or it's a cough, take that, that. But a simple chest infection, a simple chest examination would highlight, we think, would highlight a lot of it. There is a distinct noise. Or, There's mm, a crackle. Crackle that ILD gives when you examine a chest. And that is all that's needed for then for the doc GP to say, right, I need to look at this further. X-ray, da, 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 and you're in the system. It's really about, well, A, routine chest infect tests, but also knowing what to hear. So your distinctive crackle They've would be. They've got to know what to hear. <laughs> sound from yeah. a, from an ordinary chest infection to a, a pulmonary fibrosis is a crackly sound, it's a different type of sound. Um, and it does take, has to be examined. It's no good just saying you've got a cough, you've got a sore throat, which tends to be what you get treated for, which clears up a wee bit, but it never clears up totally. And eventually it just keeps building up, which, which will happen anyway. And But the diagnosis will mean you can receive the proper treatment earlier. So, so there's a delay in treatment, both because of lack of recognition of what it is and people explaining away their own condition. Because you don't know what pulmonary fibrosis is, yeah. you just think you've got a cough all the time or you've got a okay. chesty wheeze all the time. And That's you it. can't hear your own, I can't hear my own chest crackle. <laughs> I mean, well, this is unfortunate. Okay, thank you. Rachel Hamilton? You've, you've covered the um, point about awareness um, amongst GPs, and there seems as though you go through a long uh, stage of misdiagnosis. Um, no, that's kind of I, I, I'm not sure if there's uh, misdiagnosis. It's not aware of diagnosing, not misdiagnosed. It's okay. just missing the diagnosis, I think. Okay. Well, if I don't mind me saying so, I think that is a difference there. Sure, sure. No, I'm glad you clarified <laughs> that point. Um, I just wondered uh, if... What is the awareness amongst public as well? Is there resources? Is there information out there for GPs? And what is what are your examples of awareness amongst the public as well? Lots of websites on pulmonary fibrosis, but if you don't know it exists, you're not going to look them up. Okay. So if you you tell the average person I know I've had been diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, they just think, oh, you've got tablets for it, so that's okay then. They, do, they don't really understand what the condition is because you really don't hear about it. Okay. Can I just clarify, um, Jim, on your point? Sorry if I call you Jim, but Jean did. So um, I, I just wonder, uh, you were talking there about there was a delay of two to three years in seeking your first appointment, and that was because you um, had not realised that it, you thought it was uh, your age, and um, then eventually there was this asthma. I was with asthma about six or seven years before that. And with my increasing breathlessness, I just put it down to really getting older. I wasn't as active. Um, and didn't think about it. Uh, it's okay. The, the asthma, asthma treatment was working for the asthma side of it, but I was still getting breathless or getting increasingly breathless. So um, if, for example, uh, you were successful in your petition and there was funding available and there, it was resourced um, for an awareness campaign, you would have realised that perhaps you'd got the condition and you could have highlighted that to your GP. Um, I would have, but I, I, and, and before that stage was reached, I was absolutely certain um, that my wife would have said, that cough's getting worse and worse and worse and worse, get to the doctors and I say, it's going away, it's going away. It's just the asthma, I'm getting older. This is public awareness, and it's a public awareness that leads to go to the doctor's appointment, that leads to the doctor's diagnosis, and this is the sequence we've got to follow through, I think. Okay, so on the, um, obviously the uh, flu jab has a, uh, you know, uh, it has an awareness, it has a public health campaign behind it. Um, do you think there could be merit in um, kind of looking at the, doing the checks alongside something like a flu jab um, when you go for that um, and over a certain age, for example, say over 60s, over 65s? Um, yes, but a lot, a lot of, um, the flu jab does tend to go along with um, an age profile as well. 
um, if, if you yeah, if you were diagnosed with it, you get those vaccinations younger. You get pneumonia and uh, the flu at a younger age than you would from your GP normally. But um, Jean, I'm, I'm thinking in the lines of a preventative Yes, agenda. if you went for your flu jag, they'd do a sounding. Right. Yeah, that would only take a couple of minutes. Yes, yes. it could be, yes. So just to, Very simple. Just uh -huh. to clarify on that, Jean, do they currently do that? Do GPs no. currently do checks? No, not when you go for your vaccinations, because you go to, usually go to a nurse, you book in for your vaccination, you go to a nurse, and she just asks you, are you feeling all right today for your, for your vaccination? I don't, you don't get any soundings or anything, no. Okay. Well, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. Okay. I can only speak for myself. With, with the fluid jabs I've had, you get an appointment for the doctor's consultancy, and you said Saturday between 10 and 12, mm -hmm. and you and about 200 people all turn queue up, up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and queue up to get your, mm -hmm. and your jag. So there's no possibility of any examination. I suppose, sorry, convener, just one more point. Do you think that um, ILD should be put, and, and other conditions should be put on a parity with the likes of the public awareness of COPD and asthma? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Not the slightest doubt about that. If you speak to the average person in the street and you say somebody's got lung cancer, they know what it is. If they say they've got COPD, they know what it is. If they say they've got asthma, they know what it is. You say ILD. <laughs> I think the word you stop smoking, Jim, or you better stop smoking. I think the word out. disease tends to put it into people's mind. You've caught it, but you don't catch it. It just develops in you. Okay, okay. thanks. Okay, um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Good morning, Jean. Good morning, Jim. Um, in your initial submission, um, you provide statistics that's, that are taken from the uh, British Thoracic Society ILD Registry Programme Annual Report of 2015-16 uh, that show the elapsed time from initial onset of, of breathlessness to presentation. And just for the record, um, I'll give the figures. It's 46% uh, waited over two years. 25% waited one to two years, 20% waited six to 12 months, and 8% waited less than six months. So can you tell us if uh, these are the most recent figures and also uh, do they relate to the whole of the UK? Um, and perhaps you could uh, tell us if you've estimated how many sufferers there are in Scotland. Um, as far as the statistics go, we haven't been able to find any statistics that actually say how many sufferers there are in Scotland. Um, there was something in the, the parliamentary questions that I, um, I looked at that were answered. It was Colin Smith and Joe Fitzpatrick, and I looked through the questions and answered. And one of them related to the number of people on, that had received pulmonary rehabilitation. And it referred to, the answer, in the answer, it brought up a table. And in the table, I, I couldn't quite relate it to the question, okay? Because the table says the number of patients discharged from an acute hospital uh, with a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease by year 2014-18. Now, that doesn't actually relate to pulmonary rehabilitation and it doesn't really reflect the number of people diagnosed either because being in hospital and discharged means you've been an inpatient and someone like me has never been an inpatient. I've, I'm only an outpatient. So lots of people like me are not included in any of those statistics that are available. And we've not found any other statistics. Yeah. OK. So um, it so says that, yeah. you know, that actually says how many people in Scotland have it. We haven't found that. We can't find that anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, OK. One of the things I think last in the, in the petition was for the people who make, the, make these records up, if they could record it better, and rather just putting down respiratory illness, respiratory disease, or breath well, illness. Well, they're coded, things like that. But, coded, coded um, properly. It does tend to revolve around hospital admissions, hospital discharge. Most of us are actually just people who attend the respiratory clinic. Although it's a chronic disease, um, we're on their books for forever, really. You know, it's a three-monthly appointment I get, and I just keep turning up every three months for the tests and all the various things. But I won't be in those statistics. There. Okay. In reply to your first question, you asked, we, we think that British thing is, is a UK... Uh -huh. We think it's a UK one. It's a UK one. It's certainly not split up um, between Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England or anywhere else. 
Um, with regard to the breakdown, I mean, if, if we're moving this petition forward, we can hopefully uh, request a, a better breakdown if it's available. Okay, okay that's uh, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Peter. Actually, good morning, uh, Jane and James. Um, <clears throat> just to go back to the annual report and further to, 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 to Rachel Hamilton's question, I'm really interested around this idea, uh, the suggestion that people are delaying uh, going to their GP. Now, presumably, you understand that something's a mess. Yeah. Um, I just want to understand why that, why you would then delay going to the GP. Initially, it was X-rayed, must be about six years ago now, and you have one X-ray, and if it's not 100% clear, you wait, and you get sent for another one. But at the end of that, I was told, well, it looks okay, and you've not, your blood tests are okay, and this is okay, and that's okay. So it'll, your cough will probably clear up, and it's just a kind of reason thing you've had. So it kind of goes on like that, and take the allergy tablets, take the stomach tablets. So that actually went on for quite a number of years, as I said earlier on. Um, and eventually you have what is classed as an exacerbation, where it just becomes worse. It's like getting a chest infection. So you go back again, and at that point, I was eventually diagnosed. But only because I did actually say, look, I'm here because of my breathing. It's not just the chesty cough, it's much more to it. And eventually I went through all this. The, you have to go through x-rays and a CT scan, as well as seeing the specialist, then you're diagnosed. So the GP himself can't diagnose, they refer. Okay. Okay, so, uh, the, the delay is actually because you're left with kind of annoying symptoms that don't quite go away, but they'll clear up a wee bit in the good weather and then they'll get burst again in the winter. So you're on cough bottles and various things as everyone else is in the winter. Um, and, and, and as and breathlessness does uh -huh. grow on you. It gets I mean, worse. It gets worse. But if you're not active and doing something a wee bit more strenuous, you don't really know you're getting breathless. If you're sitting about, if I take this up, I could sit all day, basically, as long as I don't move. But as soon as I start moving, I start to get breathless. And when I eventually had to go, it was when I found myself cutting grass and things like that. When I just used to go up and down and up and down, I was going up and down and then I was taking a rest. Then I was going up, then I was taking a rest. Then I was going down and I was taking a rest. And they say, no, I'll have to do something. Or I'll say, hey, do something about this. And you realise then you have to do something about it. But up till then, unless you're pushed to that limit, you don't really know you're breathless unless you're exerting yourself. And that is when you find you are breathless and then, then it gets increasingly and it grows. I mean, it's, it just grows on you. But just thank, thank you for clarifying that because I was, I was, when you initially said this, I thought it was, it was, it was a man thing that we, we just don't go to the doctors. But what you're actually saying is, it's not the, it's not the initial, initially going to the doctors. It's the, it's, it's following up on that. So you go to the doctors, you get mm -hmm. some kind of diagnosis, and then you accept that diagnosis for a period of time before re returning again to the doctor to say that you feel that there's something more going on. That, that, that's what that, that, that report means. Thank you very much. OK. Um, David Torrance. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Jean and James. Um, in relation to home management, the information provided in your p petition appears to suggest that principally comes from friends, family and relatives. Can you expand on this? I'm not at the stage of... We, we work between us. I'm married and I've got a husband, obviously, and uh, we just work things between us in the house. But if I was on my own, I would find it very difficult to actually do very basic things about the house. Um, I think... At the later stage, as in, I don't have oxygen, I just have tablets, but everybody eventually gets oxygen. And I think if you had oxygen, you would really need help most of the time. Yeah, you, do, you do need uh -huh. help. You, you find yourself <laughs> unable to, if, if you're when a family, you're not, unable to do your share of what you used to do. You just can't do it. Um, it's physically impossible to do it. Um, getting showered, even dressing, things like that. It takes you longer. You just haven't got the energy to do it. You've got to stop and take a rest when you reach the oxygen stage and places like that. But you generally are working towards that. And it's debilitating and nothing you can do about it. Um, you just cannot function properly uh, and you get fatigued. Um, it's just a fact of life. So although I don't have oxygen, I would say most people at my level have, there's a lot of very basic things you would do, like changing a duvet cover. I can't do. Um, simple things like bending over to tie your shoelaces. You feel a bit dizzy and you end up sitting down again. It's very simple things that become difficult. Although I can walk about in the level, 
stairs are practically impossible. Um, so I always look for lifts and I'd look for, I plan a route. If I'm going anywhere, I plan a route that doesn't have a slope up the way, but I can cope with a slope down the way. So everywhere I go, I'm watching where I go and what the route is I take to get there and back. I now tend to wear slip-on shoes, etc., because I just find it very difficult to bend and do something. I, c I can hardly blow up the car tyres if I go to the garage. I, c I can't bend down long enough and stay fatigued without getting fatigued. I cannot do it. I've got to get somebody to do it for me or buy someone that can attach it. I just cannot work when bending down and bending down exaggerates. You just cannot breathe uh, and you just cannot function. Yep. Um, in your petition, you say that there's not a uniform service from local authorities across Scotland. Um, have you got any examples of this? And how much help do you actually get from local authorities? Um, I, I, I was at a, a course thing and speaking to a lot of people at it and hearing all of them, and it's quite evident that there's a postcode does operate to, to a certain extent for a lot of things, and that's just a fact of life. Um, and I think it depends on what area in Scotland and whether you get a chairlift easily or whether you even get one at all or whether you get minor things like bath, a new bathroom or anything like that. Even grab handles put on somewhere. It depends very much on your local authority and it depends on their funding because let's face it, they're not all well funded enough to do a lot of that and it all comes back down to funding and that's what we're asking for is extra funds for all these things. Uh, Brian Whittle. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I could just uh, follow on from that, I'm, I'm presuming what, you, what, what you're uh, discussing here is obviously once you have a, a diagnosis and, and, and specific requirements, you mentioned stair lifts, uh, presumably you know, walk-in showers or, or, or toilets, etc. And given that you've, you've said that, that, that it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a condition that's not readily recognised at the moment or long-term recognised, um, I would presume then you would say that that, that, that exacerbates that difficulty in uh, accessing uh, those, those extra items that you need. Uh, and also, what other items would you include uh, in there? And, and uh, these things that you want to see included in that sort of cohesive natural ma uh, ma national management policy that you've suggested uh, that you would like to be established? A lot of questions there, sorry. <laughs> I, I would think if, if I approached the, the local authority for assistance like that, I would like to think the local authority maybe send somebody out to do a, an assessment of my, my house and say, yes, 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 oh, no, no, you don't need that or we can do this. But nobody does that. As far as I'm aware, nobody does a house assessment for cases like that. And maybe if you ask for a chairlift, someone will look at that. Maybe if you ask for one thing, but somebody should come out and actually do a proper assessment of your house and help you make up your mind and provide, not just what you need today, but what you're going to need tomorrow and the next day and the following day. Just sorry, is, is that perhaps uh, along, along the lines you've suggested before that it's a condition that's not recognised? So when you, when, when you approach uh, local authorities, they're, they're, it's not within... It's, it's, it's not in their book, book so to speak. Is it, it, I think it tends, because it's a breathing issue, it's still not seen as being in a par with mobility issues. People don't quite relate the breathing to why you're not mobile. They, can't, they don't quite understand why you can't climb stairs and walk about because your breathing's not working. They think, well, your arms and legs are working, so you should still be able to do it. So it's, just like, it's just lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge, I think. Yes, I do think that. Um, you, asked, you talked about um, extra training for GPs, the fundamental issue that even if they were listening, they're not hearing, they don't know what they're listening for. Who do you think should conduct that training? Have you had any discussions with bodies that represent GPs? Well, I haven't. Uh, no, we, we no haven't. but I, I suppose it would be respiratory specialists to deal with it. Beyond that, we're not, we're not medical enough to <laughs> kind of really be into that depth, you know. <laughs> I mean, we're just, we're just people that have got the disease, uh, and, and I mean, yeah, it's be the respiratory specialists who, who are and the ones who identify the conditions eventually. that you've come across talked about. This is an issue about the lack of awareness, awareness amongst those that are referring to them. You think this is something the medical profession itself, 
at the level where they do understand it are aware that it's a disconnect. Had anything said? And I've not asked. I've, I've never asked. spoken to a consultant in that way. Mm -hmm. The consultants I spoke with, and as I said in my own experience, I was recognised by that doctor mm -hmm. um, who had experience, must have had experience of it beforehand. But it's a thing they've got to think experience before they can deal with it. Um, and there seems to be a way of even sounding the chest to recognise the crackle. You know, it's not just a quick breathe in, breathe out. You've got to do it a certain way. And we don't think um, that all GPs are fully trained for this. And I'll bring Rachel in a minute. But the other question I wanted to ask you was, from these questions that Colin Smith asked and Joe Fitzpatrick responded to, my understanding is basically Joe Fitzpatrick has said as the minister, this is a matter for um, clinicians and for health boards. I'm assuming you think that's there needs to be more central direction than that, that it can't simply be left to the health boards themselves to decide how much of a priority they give the condition? Uh, I personally have no idea how health boards operate and, and how the whole system operates. We just know there seems to be a lack of awareness and a lack of for it being dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, who, who makes these laws and who makes these arrangements is beyond <coughs> us. As I say, it's mm -hmm. not my salary scale. Um, yeah, and I think the other point you make about keeping people at home makes sense for the health service and therefore it, people managing the condition mm -hmm, is actually yeah. mm -hmm, yes, relieving resources within the health service. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rachel? Uh, it was just a supplemental to, to your uh, question, Joanne. Um, I, I would imagine that it would be d determined um, the, the prevalence rate compared to other conditions. And obviously there's a comp competing demand across many conditions to raise awareness and prioritise um, certain conditions. Um, I actually wondered, um, well, first of all, I think it's important that the statistics are right. Uh, you know, um, because there is a lack of um, Scottish statistics. However, have you worked at all with uh, the British Lung Foundation? Uh, I, I have had, well, I've had some contact, contact with them, yes. And, uh, and there was something put out with my picture on it to all sufferers, or, or, or their people anyway, um, mm -hmm. showing that they should support the petition, etc. Yes. Okay. And, and just another um, point that Joanne made um, about GPs. Is there any uh, um, merit in looking at uh, other healthcare professionals, such as practice nurses, actually doing the check um, and, and it becoming part of a package of... Um, um, I, I, mean, I know you said it, the age thing perhaps is not relevant to this condition. However, Jim said differently and said that it, he thought it was because of its old age. So could there be some checks? And that was my point, really, with the flu jab, kind of rolling it into that so that you're reaching more people. It could be, but the problem with sort of restricting it and saying it's, it's age, right, um, if, if you take into account most people have it longer than they're diagnosed, um, lots of people will have it before they're 60. You know, that, that's one of the, the, the issues that it is being seen as older. So it's been kind of, I think in the past we shoved to the side of it because it's an old, it's an old condition and it's just your breathing going. Um, if it was diagnosed sooner in some way, it wouldn't be seen like that. It does affect younger people. Okay. Yeah. As Jean says, I mean, it's when you start to walk up a, walk up a hill, you, you start to find out you cannot do it. And you're not always walking up hills and it's something that just grows. It's a slow burner within you that is just growing and growing and growing. Sorry, Jim, if you had got the opportunity to go to a, another healthcare <laughs> professional, such as a practice nurse, in a, a more informal manner than make an appointment with a GP, would you have done that? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. On, the, on the assumption she's qualified to do it, yes, of yeah. course I would. Okay, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I wonder if you, I mean, given that, that, so there's a lack of awareness of the condition, how it's felt, how it's experienced, how it's then treated. Is there an issue about um, people who have the condition not then being um, given the relevant support within the benefit system, the social security system? I, 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 that's, I, I, that's, I, that's a, that's a difficult, I difficult I one. I um, everybody's different and I think when people are older, certainly by the time I, I, I stopped work, I just stopped work to my pension. So um, 
I didn't actually think of anything like that at all. But obviously, if you were younger, um, and there are some younger ones in, this, mm -hmm. in the support group that we attend, I was surprised. I think the youngest 39, but I think she still works. But they are still entitled um, to claim some benefits. But we're not that knowledgeable no, on not, the benefits no, side of it. it Maybe one that okay. the petition itself might flag up that the system more generally. Like something should, up. Uh -huh. um, appreciate. I think, I think we've come to the end of our questions. So thank you very much for that. In terms of um, how we want to take this forward, I think Angus made a point about whether it would be possible to get a breakdown in statistics. We should, I think, be asking for that. Brian. Um, uh, two, two things jump out, jump out for me: data gathering. Um, which, which seems to be a theme that, that runs through quite a lot of these uh, these kinds of investigations. The other thing that strikes me is if I was a GP uh, watching the petitions committee on a regular basis, or, or, or the health and sport committee on a regular basis, the, the call for them to retrain <laughs> across, so we had ME last week, we've had Lyme disease, now we've got ILD, I'm wondering whether there's a bigger piece of work here around, you know, because this is, a, again, a two recurring themes. It's GP knowledge and data gathering. And I'm wondering whether there's a bigger piece of work here. Maybe maybe not for this committee, maybe for the Health and Sport Committee, but because, because we, you know, if I was a GP watching this, I would be hiding under the desk at the number of things I've now got to retrain on that we continually hear about. Um, I'm just wondering whether I'm just putting that out there. Yeah, could be yeah, something we could do in um, contact in the GPs Association. Um, although it does strike me there'll be very few GPs will be watching this, given the amount of pressure they're under. That they're um, and if you don't know about a condition and you're not aware of how to identify it, then the gap is not in the GP, it's the gaps in the system that's not making sure that they're informed of that. So I certainly think we should write to Scottish Government ask for its views. I think the fact that Joe Fitzpatrick in his response has said this is a matter for health boards um, and clinicians probably isn't sufficient if there's a lack of awareness. Anything else we should be doing, Rachel? Yeah. I'd write to NHS Education Scotland to actually look at what they're doing in terms of uh, what, what the, the information that is out there um, for, for awareness. Uh, I also wonder whether we should... Um, ask ISD what they're doing with regard to reporting on ILDs? Well, the, it, it, you know, the, um, for the statistics. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Angus? Um, yeah, there was mention earlier about the National Respiratory Plan, um, but I'm not, I need some clarification on where that is. Has it been completed or has it still been worked on? I don't think from what I read, I think it's been started. I don't think there's right. anything on... I think there's an intention to do it, but I don't think they've got to the point of bringing a, even people together right. with terms of reference, but we certainly could ask the Scottish Government about that as well. It'd be good to get an update on that, yeah. So I think in the first instance, it is about perhaps contacting stakeholders who have an interest in this area and may be able to add to the information, but very particularly to the Scottish Government itself. What is its view on... You know, prevalence of the condition, awareness of the condition, training for the medical profession and supports to people who have the condition. And this question about this feels to me to fall into preventative medicine. That is that people, if they're supported to manage the condition at home, they're less likely to be having to go into hospital or whatever. So it kind of fits in with all of that. Anything else specifically we'd be doing at this stage? I think that's a good start. Um, to some of the charities that are involved. Okay, we can identify what those are um, and we can contact them in terms of you know, the obvious ones being the, the Chest, Heart and Stroke, British Thoracic Society, British Lung Foundation, which were mentioned. But if there are others that you're aware of, then you can, you can let us know. Brian? It was mentioned around the, what would happen if you approached the local councils. And, and the, I wonder if Cosla would be somebody that would right. we, we would consider speaking to what, what, the, what, the, what the local council's approach would be to this, how they, they deal with it. It's obviously um, the home management was mentioned, uh, and that will be a part of how much treatment um, in an NHS setting or home management uh, and that balance. I think we, if we stick with Cosla 
and to simply contact them to see is this something they're aware of um, and what, is there any guidance on it? I think that would be a, a, good, a good starting point um, on that. So, there's, so there, there's quite a lot to be done. I think the most critical one probably is the Scottish Government itself because we're asking them to think about you know, what, what appropriate training is, what the awareness amongst the profession, but also for people in the community who may have the condition. I think that is, um, is significant. So when we get responses back, the petitioners, you will, you will um, be informed of what those are and you'll be able to give further comment before it comes back to us. So you will be able to um, put your stamp and view on what we're getting back. And I think that would be immensely helpful to our next consideration. Um, so I think we recognise the importance of what you've brought here today and the significance of it, partly because nobody knows about it, which tells you something in itself. Um, and therefore, as a consequence, there are things happening which are probably um, making it more difficult for people to live with their condition, but it's also probably ending up being more costly to the system as well. So I think I want to thank you very much for that. I think that's, we have found that very useful, and I think there's a lot of useful information that we'll now seek. And as we said, once we have that and you've had a look at it, you'll be able to give us your further views on, on what that says. Okay, so can I thank you very much for your attendance and can I suspend the meeting briefly um, to allow the witnesses to leave the table? Okay, that is. Right, we can call the meeting um, back to order. We're now moving to the next petition, which is petition 1715 on closed containment for salmon farms in Scotland. The petition was lodged by Mark Carter on behalf of Marine Concern and seeks action to ensure that the salmon farming industry in Scotland uses only a closed containment method of farming. The note prepared by the Clarks and Spice outlines a number of steps that have already been taken in this area, including separate inquiries undertaken by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee and the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Those committees recommended that independent research on the benefits of closed containment farming methods can be undertaken as a matter of urgency. In its response to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee report, the Scottish Government stated that the industry was already undertaking research in this area. I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action based on the information set out in a meeting paper and further to yesterday afternoon's debate on the issue. Angus. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. Well, uh, certainly as a, a veteran of the 2012 Aquaculture Bill, um, I, I've certainly learned more about salmon uh, farming and wild fisheries than I ever thought I would. Um, in yesterday's debate in the Chamber, um, on the, the, the REC and the Clear Committee's joint report, there, there was unfortunately little mention of a uh, closed containment, although uh, it was highlighted that uh, they're moving forward at a pace uh, with it in, in Norway. Um, so, you know, it's, it's clear that closed containment would have a massive uh, environmental benefit, but there was no indication yesterday from the CABSEC, the Cabinet Secretary, that uh, that's a direction that the Scottish Government is keen to, to, to move forward with at a, a pace, um, or certainly not going, going at a pace to the extent that the petitioner is, is looking for. Um, so, I mean, it, well, it may well be that the, the closed containment 
um, is the answer to the majority of the environmental problems that the industry is facing, and I, personally, I'm, I'd be keen to see it uh, move forward. But um, given that we didn't get uh, a lot of clarity on it from the, the government yesterday in the debate, um, I'd certainly be keen to, to write to the Scottish Government to ask uh, exactly where they are with regard to, to supporting this uh, in the industry. Um, and that would allow us to decide what next steps we can take with the, with the petition. Okay, any other comments? Just, I, would, I would agree with that. I think mm -hmm. that the... the We've, I mean, I've, I've only been on this committee for this this term, and uh, I, I, like my colleague, I now know more about salmon fishing than <laughs> I could possibly know. But um, I, I think there's certainly an interest around closed closed containment, um, uh, and I think there's interest to see what the argument against it's around this, this cost prohibitive at the moment. But you know, I'd be interested to see what the Norwegian model model is. I would. And again, like others, I don't have a lot of expertise and experience in the area, although I'm conscious it's something that the Parliament has looked at since the very early days. And I suppose what I'm interested in, I mean, I recognise economic significance in, in some remote communities of, of some very high-skilled jobs, um, and whether close containment has actually an animal, animal welfare issues. It doesn't feel to me that being in a box on land is like some, something natural or even akin to what a, a salmon would experience but as I said that's not something that um, I have any experience on but so the idea that we would you know get clarification from the Scottish Government if this is something they are actually looking at because I think you know it doesn't sound as if that was what I had thought that the debate and the report from the committee would really address the issues that have been highlighted but maybe this is one area that we want to look at a wee bit further. Yes, and I think it would be good at this stage to hear from the industry as well, so um, writing to the uh, Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation um, and possibly some of the main players like Marine Harvest or Sc Scottish Salmon Farming Company, um, who, who, who may well be developing these. Uh, the, the, the problem is that the, the, the joint report conducted by um, SAMS and... Um, the, the resultant report uh, by the two committees was was done about a year ago, and you know things are moving forward. So uh, uh, it would be interesting to see where where they are now. Okay. So if that's sure. um, ask Angus on that that the inquiry that was done into salmon farming was quite extensive, and are you saying that um, you believe that sort of technology? Um, and advancement has moved on so much so that, that it actually the closed containment wasn't looked at at that point. No, it, it, it was looked at. There's reference to it in the report. What I'm saying is it wasn't uh, discussed uh, in much detail yesterday during the debate in, in the chamber. Okay. Um, but no, there, there, there is a, a, a certainly development in Norway uh, with regard to closed containment, and it would be good to find out exactly where the Norwegians are with it as well. Right, OK. okay. <laughs> So if that's agreed, we, we would, um, as Angus suggested, write the Scottish Government in particular, but perhaps to these others who have an interest in industry, around this, specifically on the question of closed containment. If that's agreed. In that case, we can move on to agenda item three, which is the consideration of continued petitions. <coughs> the next petition is petition um, 1700 on progression of the process for a section 30 order to hold Scottish referendum on independence from the United Kingdom. The petition was lodged by Martin James Keatings on behalf of Forwarders One. We considered this petition in September last year and agreed to write to the Scottish Government for clarity in its position on a possible referendum. The response from the Scottish Government states, quote, the First Minister has made clear that she will provide an update on the issue of an independence referendum when there is greater clarity about the terms of Brexit. And as recently as a day or so ago in a speech in the USA, the First Minister confirmed Quote, I, as First Minister, have said I will outline my thoughts on the timing of another independence referendum in the next few weeks. The committee has received around half a dozen emails in recent days urging the committee to support the petition. And I think, as we have said in previous meetings, the Public Petitions Committee is a cross party, um, so it's not expected that we'll agree on the merits or otherwise of a referendum on independence. The briefing note includes a comment on engagement with the public as the petitioners seemed concerned that the public's views on this issue had not been adequately heard. And I wonder if members have any comments on this aspect. 
and in terms of the petition, do members feel there is anything further to be gained in keeping the petition open? Angus? Um, well, clearly, um, we don't want to get into the uh, merits for or against a, a referendum, but uh, I can't avoid straying into a political comment here, convener, um, as a member of the SNP. Um, I can fully understand the, the petitioner's keenness to see uh, a Section 30 order requested. However, um, the, the petitioner will be fully aware of the First Minister's and the Scottish Government's stance, which you've alluded to in, in your remarks, uh, convener, and um, the petitioner will have seen that the most you'll have seen the most recent utterances from the, the First Minister that she will be making uh, her position and the Scottish Government's clear uh, position clear in, in a matter of, of weeks. Um, but I think while the um, Brexit saga continues and develops into what I would class as a, a nightmare, um, it's, it's clear to me that, that we need to see what transpires over the next few weeks, uh, first and foremost, before um, you know, we hear uh, what the final position is of the Scottish Government. Um, I, I, I think the Scottish Government's position couldn't be any clearer uh, at the moment, given uh, the turmoil that the country is experiencing. OK. Brian? I think the... Um, you know, again, not, not, I'm not going to stray into party politics here. I think, you know, um, we, you know we must respect um, anybody's opinion and whatever that opinion happens to be. I think the only issue I have with this petition is that it leaves it open for another petition to come in to speak against it. You know, and, and, and what, we, what we would then be doing is, is, is taking the independence uh, debate and issue from the wider, uh, sort of the wider population into a, into a committee debate. So um, I think we understand that it's uh, the, the, the Scottish Government's responsibility um, to, to bring these, to bring the, to bring this forward, if, it, if if it's their wish, and for that debate then to happen. So, um, although I completely respect the the petitioner's uh, views here, I'm not sure how, in petitioning uh, petitioning the government or petitioning this parliament, that then forces the Scottish government or encourages the Scottish government to do something that, it, that it's already, you know. Considering, and let's face it, is your raison d'être, <laughs> you know, it's already your raison d'être. So I don't, I'm, I'm not quite sure where where this petition lies within within the whole uh, that, that 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 whole debate. To be honest, I suppose the test for me around the effectiveness of the petitions committee is it highlighting something people are not aware of? Is it giving an opportunity to have a debate that wouldn't happen otherwise, or is there a lack of clarity on the part of? Um, those in authority about what their position is and, and actually on all of these grounds this petition um, in my view is not one that we would gain a lot from continuing because it's clearly going to be debated um, and people in, around this room will be in different positions on that petition even though we're very often very much agreed on the impact of Brexit and so on um, and it is something that is going to be debated whether I want it to be debated or not it is part of very much part of the political debate across the country, um, and the Scottish government has made very clear what its position is, which is they don't will not pursue it till a, till a later stage. But this is clearly something that is continuing. So, in a sense, this debate for me is something that's, that Scotland continues to wrestle with. But I don't believe that the public petitions committee is where we will wrestle with it because it will continue. Anyway, it's not that we're putting a block on it. It's not that um, we're preventing that debate happening. I'm very conscious that um, it is something that, that runs like a current still through Scottish politics, whether some of us like that or not. Um, and certainly from the point of view of the Scottish Government, they've made clear their position. So I suppose my own view is that we should close the petition. Um, and I'm interested in other people's views, but it would be because I am absolutely certain that that's not the end to the debate and the petitions committee will not be where the differences we have on the question will be resolved. And I don't know if there's David, if you want to say anything. Um, Convener, the Scottish Government's um, clarified its position and I'm quite happy about you on this. This debate will be carried out elsewhere. It's not for this committee to take it forward like that. So I'm quite happy to support you to close the petition. 
Is that agreed then? Okay, that we, we agree that we would um, close the petition on the grounds that the Scottish Government has clarified its position. There are likely to be many opportunities for the Parliament to debate the issue and for constituents to engage with members, and that there are many channels through which the petitioner continue to raise the issue. And I want to emphasise again um, that it's not about um, having a view on what the petition calls for, it's whether this is the best place for that conversation to continue. And we would want to thank the petitioner to, for bringing uh, the petition forward and affording us the opportunity to clarify the view of the Scottish Government on the matter. So if that's agreed. Okay, in that case, if we can move on to the next petition, which is petition 1463 on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. And can I welcome Elaine Smith, MSP, for um, the, um, uh, attending during the consideration of this petition. The petition was lodged in December 2012. It was first considered by the Public Petitions Committee in session four, with consideration continuing in session five. On the 29th of March 2018, the committee published a report on the petition um, 1463. A debate in the petition was held in the chamber on 4th of December 2018. And there were several issues that came out of that debate that we may want to consider. There was a minister's confirmation that NICE intends to develop a guidance, a guideline on thyroid disease with publication expected in November 2019. The minister also highlighted that the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Gregor Smith, has met with representatives from NHS Education Scotland and that an endocrine learning module has recently been produced for GPs. The Chief Medical Officer Speciality Advisor for Endocrinology has been asked by Dr Smith to review this in light of the issues raised through the petition. In relation to the prescribing of T3, the Minister has undertaken to write to health boards to confirm that patients who need access to T3 under an endocrinologist can obtain it. He also asked all members to make him aware of any instances where patients cannot access this as a treatment. There were also a few calls for a short inquiry to be carried out by the Health and Sports Committee. Obviously, any such inquiry would be a matter for the committee and it would need to take into consideration its other work programme commitments. Um, the cost of T3 was also raised as a possible barrier to treatment. And as was mentioned in the debate, the pricing of medicines is a reserved matter. And I wonder if members have any observations. It might be maybe helpful to hear from Elaine first, uh, given that you had participated in the debate and have pursued these issues over a significant amount of time. Thanks very much, convener, um, and, and thanks for allowing me to come along to the committee. I can first of all start by thanking the committee for the, their work and the debate in the chamber. Um, I think, obviously, the committee know what the issues are very well. Uh, it can be quite difficult at times to get to grips with, but I think the committee did manage um, to do that. I can also just, uh, on the record, thank Dr Toff. He's retiring, I've just heard, um, and he himself has been on a, a thyroid journey over the past decade, often against some intransigent establishment views, and just also because he saved my own life, uh, I think, the lives of others. So put that in the record and can also most of all thank Lorraine Cleaver. She had hoped to be here today, but unfortunately she couldn't be. Um, T3 was not really her issue, but it kind of took over the debate to some extent because of the massive price hike, meaning that the boards were refusing to prescribe it. What Lorraine, I think, wanted when she started out with the position was to help other people avoid the horrors that she'd been through, but hopeful that an outcome might be that she could get her own desiccated thyroid hormone on prescription here rather than having to buy it over the internet. Um, we've, we've obviously not really reached that stage, despite it being the only treatment and extremely effective until T4 was invented and made money for the pharma industry. We know it still remains unavailable in this country. Um, it's not something they can make money out of, and that, that's unfortunate. I think your paper today and the way you've um, outlined it, convener, if I might say, is, is very informative and it highlights some of the remaining outstanding issues. Uh, one of them is the possible health inquiry and it was supported, as you said, by some health members in the committee. I think the main reasons for the health inquiry would be that it's an ongoing issue. It's directly affecting health and wellbeing of patients who are mainly women. And although the petition has helped to raise the profile of the issue, it's not been a resolution to all of the issues. So I think um, we need some more clarity on the guidance by government and health organisations. There's inconsistencies, um, and I think what a health inquiry might do is like if, if we think about the MESH inquiry, if it could hear directly from 
women who are suffering and what the issues are, then that's really, really powerful. And perhaps even for endocrinologists who um, are prescribing T3 and have seen the differences. Because, that, you know, in some ways it's important to support that because they are also up against the establishment. And obviously it's up to the health committee. I've written to them and I think I've sent you all a copy of the letter that I've sent to the health committee. Um, unfortunately, uh, you pointed out that the, the minister had said he would write to health boards. Um, he, he may have done, but unfortunately, nothing has changed. Um, I sent some examples to Joe Fitzpatrick, um, and the reply I got was, was rather worrying. I have it here. Basically, it, it said that um, the it's important to emphasise that clinicians can prescribe T3 or recommend prescribing T3 for an individual patient if their symptoms are not adequately controlled with T4. That decision is ultimately for the clinicians involved in the case, but he then goes on to say, and the relevant NHS board to take. And unfortunately, the relevant boards, uh, specifically the, the three I've been dealing with um, at the moment, are NHS Tayside, Grampian and Ayrshire and Arran, are still refusing to prescribe T3 to patients. Um, I'm not going to take much longer. I know, obviously, committee members may want to, to come in. I would imagine they would. But if I could just share with you some of the words of um, patients. One, one patient to yourself, in fact, convener, said the words spoken by Mr Fitzpatrick gave me real hope that my fight for T3 was finally over. Um, well, NHS Tayside have removed T3 from their formulary. That is the procedure on prescribing T3. I cannot put into words how angry, disgusted and frustrated and upset I am. Um, she says it's a cruel blow and it was hard to bear. And that was just dated um, end of January. So it's very recent. She's not getting her T3. Um, <clears throat> another one was uh, who's saying she's been on a combination T4, T3 for 10 years. Without T3, I'm unable to function properly. Struggling with mental health at the moment as it is. Only just starting to plan for my future. Um, basically, if my T3 is stopped, they might as well just give me a loaded gun. And that was dated um, just the end of last year. It was after the debate. That's another own live case. Um, and again, another one that uh, a woman couldn't get it, but she's getting it buying it privately and she's doubled her kidney function on her own and she can breathe without inhalers and steroids and she's having to do that on her own because she's not getting the T3. So unfortunately um, committee's work has been excellent, the debate was really good, I was really heartened by the minister but this, um, this clause if you like in his letter that it's up to health boards, unfortunately health boards are taking that to mean that they don't have to prescribe it even when clinicians are um, so, I think it, it's essential, really, that government addresses this, the genuine experiences and concerns of um, patients and sufferers. And I think that, uh, if I might just suggest that, um, that the committee keep this petition open just now, simply because there's so many outstanding factors, not least that the health board still aren't prescribing it. And I think that there's a lot of follow-up to be done from the committee debate. I'm certainly trying to go through it at the moment and pick up things that I want to, to write about myself of interest. But I think it's something the committee might want to do as well. So, for instance, Dr Smith's um, comments and maybe just getting some feedback on what has happened with that. But the most worrying thing is that health boards are just basically ignoring the, what the minister said, they're ignoring clinicians and they're certainly ignoring women whose lives depend upon um, the treatment. Okay, thanks for that, Lynn. So the, the, I think what I took from the debate and was reassured by and I've had some uh, constituents cases, which was they got a diagnosis, they got a prescription by the clinician, but then the system was saying, but we don't have to prescribe that. We're not going to prescribe it, even although it's been identified as what you need. And I think the reassurance we got in the debate was that wasn't the case. And you're saying that actually some in a quite emotive and powerful language, actually, people are talking about the impact on them. So the question for the Petitions Committee is not that these issues remain and are significant, it's whether we can um, help or whether, in fact, it should be, we should be passing on to the Health Committee, given the Minister's um, commitment and the question of accountability. I suppose from the petition's point of view, um, 
we have to think about how productive we can be and also just be alive to the fact of how long the petition has, has been on our books, if you like. Brian? Interesting, a lot, a lot of my information came from uh, a man who's, who's uh, a friend of mine who's, who's um, uh, suggestion that T3 has changed his his life around. So I know it's predominantly women, it's not, it's not uh, exclusively women. I think that the, the debate which, which I took part in, I thought was, was I was very hopeful, uh, having sat through the, and taken part in that debate and, and, and listened to the reply from the minister and, and that perhaps we were getting ourselves to a position where uh, the, the committee could step back from this. And there's a couple of things that, that uh, I said, the inconsistency in the, the, the health boards that still nag away at me here. Um, I mean, I know the Health and Sport Committee um, is considering uh, doing a, 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 an investigation. Perhaps we should write to them to ask them whether that's, that's something they're going to do. Um, um, and also, I'd quite like to hear from Joe Fitzpatrick and his uh, having written to all the health boards what the responses have been. And if there are, if we have highlighted uh, certain health boards who um, are recognising that there are patients who require um, T3 as a treatment but then not prescribing it, why don't we just ask them directly why not? Uh, you know, you know. That in itself, to me, would 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 um, put a little bit of pressure on them to. to Rachel, I think it's really important that we get the uh, clear reasons uh, established because within the debate, uh, it was very much teased out that it was due to cost and supply issues of T3, and I'm wondering whether it still is the case within um, the health boards that it's not clinical reasons that they're not. Um, allowing this uh, essential drug to come forward, but it was due to the cost and the supply issues. Now, I don't know how this com committee can uh, take that forward if that's a reserved matter, um, and I think it's a quite a weak um, position if we if we say, well, why don't the petitioners take this forward with their local MPs, and um, as it is a reserve matter. I wondered if there was anything to add to Brian's um, letter to, to Joe Fitzpat Fitzpatrick to actually find out what is the true reason why the local health boards um, are not releasing this, and is it really due to cost, or is it really due to choice and the, the clinical reasons? Mm -hmm. actual, if you look at the actual cost to the health budget, Although T3 um, in, in itself is, is uh, comparatively expensive, to, uh, the overall cost, the number of patients that are actually been treated by it doesn't actually amount to a huge amount of money. So that, that's, that's why it nags away at me, this idea that it could be cost, because the actual cost of the health budget isn't that high. David? You know, I'm just wondering if it's more appropriate now, because I think the public petitions is probably taking it as far as it could go, especially with the debate in Parliament, that the Health and Sport Committee have an inquiry in it. We could ask him if he would do it, as both me and Brian are on the Health and Sport. Um, I think they would probably be able to take it a wee bit further than uh, what we can now. Angus? Um, well, I would share the comments made by uh, other members regarding the, the Minister's reassurances or the disappointment eh, that the Minister's reassurances haven't been followed through eh, at, at health board level. Um, you know, like, like everyone else who was in the debate, I, I, I left the chamber feeling quite heartened with the response that we'd, we'd got from the Minister. Um, but if there are still eh, ongoing issues, eh, then, then they, they clearly have to be addressed. And the best way to do that would probably be a health and sport committee uh, inquiry, but um, I think following on from David Torrance's suggestion, I think we would need to get confirmation from the Health and Sport Committee that they were going to go ahead with that first before we could close the petition, um, in, a, in all fairness to, to the petitioners uh, and Elaine Smith, who's, who's uh, followed us from day one. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think we need to get confirmation first that that would be the course of action that they would be happy with before we uh, close it, because there's clearly unanswered questions remaining. 
Okay, so um, we have the option of referring the petition to them, but I think I, I detect a bit of unease that we just simply then don't, we don't have any certainty that the inquiry would um, be conducted, but there is a particular role for the Health Committee in holding the Minister to account and you know the health board's account as well in a way that perhaps we can't do. Um, th th really the outstanding question then is, I think my sense is that we don't want to close it, but we want to contact the health committee and um, get confirmation then of their interest in doing an inquiry. The only outstanding point then is whether we want ourselves to do anything in relation to the health boards at this point um, in the lines that Brian has outlined. Rachel? Um, I've. I know that we had the debate and Elaine Smith was very keen that the recommendations um, of the inquiry were put forward to um, the Health and Sport Committee and I know that Miles Briggs said the same thing. However, I've got a niggle that we just, we should really speak to um, Joe Fitzpatrick prior to giving this to the Health and Sport Committee. And I don't know how oner onerous that would be for the committee, but just to say we've had the de we've done the inquiry, we've do had the debate. There are still unanswered questions. I just don't feel that it's it's been properly kind of rounded off. You're not suggesting it would be rounded off. I mean, I think everybody's recognised there's more work to be done, and in my view, the best place for that to happen is within the health committee. But what we are seeing, the work needs to be done, and if the health committee is not going to do it. We don't want to let go of the petition in case that's a decision that's been made. Um, in either event, Joe Fitzpatrick's going to be in front of a committee, isn't he? Um, so can I suggest that what we do is we recognise that there are issues that we had thought had been identified and clarified in the debate that are still questions for us. And I think the correspondence that Elaine reads out would trouble anybody that we've, people feel that they've been left in that position that our preferred position is that the Health Committee would conduct an inquiry, but we recognise that's out with our gift to determine that, that would happen. So we would write to them. Um, and if, if it isn't going to be done through the Health Committee, then we need to reflect further on what we would do. And that might then at that point mean that we would be bringing representative of the Health Board, so our uh, Joe Fitzpatrick back in front of us. So does that make, would that make people's agreement then? Okay, in that case, we are um, agreeing to write to the Health Committee, um, urging them really to conduct a short inquiry, reflecting not just on issues in the debate, but issues that seem to have emerged from the debate that we hadn't really um, expected. Um, if that's agreed, I would thank Elaine Smith for her attendance today as well. Um, and if that's all in that petition, can I uh, close the formal part of the meeting and move into private session? Thank you.